Cindy Marie Lesko. In 1986, Cindy married a man named Albert Lesko III in Detroit, Michigan, and they would go on to have a son and a daughter together. It was always a tumultuous relationship, and over the years, Cindy would report Albert for abusing her twice, once in 1989 and another in 1992. As is common with domestic violence between spouses, he apologized and she dropped the charges. Then came something Albert found to be unforgivable. Cindy tipped off police investigators that she found six pounds of marijuana that Albert Lesko had concealed inside the family's home. Lesko responded by brutally beating Cindy. This time she would not drop the charges, and he was convicted of the physical abuse and found himself facing additional drug charges for the marijuana. By now, Cindy had had enough of Lesko. As scary as it was to start over, it was scarier to stay. She filed for a divorce and was awarded temporary custody of the couple's two children, along with possession of the family home. She was also prepared to be the star witness at the upcoming trial for Lesko. The trial for possession with intent to sell had been postponed, the reason being as soon as she was divorced, she would no longer be restricted by spousal immunity which so far Lesko's attorneys were using against her to keep her from testifying. Cindy was speaking on the phone to a relative of hers the day she went missing. She was worried and angry because her husband had taken the kids and he was supposed to return hours prior. She was upset it was a school night and frightened for their safety. At about 10 p.m. that night, he finally showed up. The police would later surmise there was an argument when Albert finally returned with the kids, resulting in her death. They had a witness statement from a neighbor that reported seeing the two arguing on the lawn that night. At one point, Cindy called for help, but it appears no one did and no one summoned law enforcement either. They eventually went back inside and there's no indication she ever walked out of the house again on her own. It is believed that Albert strangled Cindy. Albert was seen coming back outside less than a half hour later. She did not come back outside, not even to say goodbye to the kids she was so anxiously waiting for. He took both kids home with him, and this was a big deal as he was living with his parents four hours away. He drove with the children back to his parents' house. He would later claim she told him to take the kids back with him and instructed him to take them to school the next day, which makes little sense since that means an eight-hour drive for the kids before school, not to mention it would come out afterwards that he did not bother to take the kids to school the next day. According to him, Cindy was alive and well when he left. He has no idea what happened to her. The children would later say they were asleep on and off during the ride from northern Michigan back home, including the time they were waiting in the driveway. Cindy was reported as a missing person on October 24th after she failed to arrive as scheduled for a nursing school class. Her vehicle was found abandoned on the side of the road in Detroit. Eventually, Lesko would deny hurting his wife but admitted to parking Cindy's car on the side of the road to punish her for being angry with him. No trace of Cindy would be found at her home at all. She didn't show up for class, and she had an exam the next morning. Her purse and wallet were found in the car that had been abandoned, as well as the handgun she normally carried. She would eventually be a no-show for the hearing for her divorce settlement that was supposed to happen the day her car was discovered. As a result, Lisko was granted full custody of the children, and he simply chose to move back into his former home now that his wife had conveniently disappeared. The authorities believe she was possibly buried somewhere along Interstate 75 in Michigan or near the couple's cabin in Oscoda County. They would eventually conduct multiple searches, but nothing was ever found. Everyone around the couple was convinced that Lesko killed Cindy, and he was eventually charged with their homicide in 2001 despite not having a body. They believed they had a strong case, as far as the circumstantial evidence around her disappearance was pretty clear, and his past history of abusing her did not help. He would go on to testify at the trial that he wasn't to blame for abusing Cindy, and all of the domestic abuse was her fault. One of Lesko's own friends came forward to admit that Albert Lesko came to him, begging him to help with disposing of Cindy's body. The kids stood up for their dad, saying they believe their dad is innocent and their mom chose to walk away on her own accord. They both testified they were sleeping in the car in the cab of the truck and didn't hear anything go wrong that night. The jury would then go on to acquit Albert of all charges, saying there is no proof that his wife was dead. 
So as of December 2001, Lesko was again a free man, and he maintains he's an innocent victim of circumstances. His confession to his friend, his moving her car to abandon it along with her purse, his taking the kids four hours away on a school night, none of that convinced the jury. After all, he said she was alive when he left. Several searches for Cindy's body have taken place over the years, but all have been unsuccessful. Cindy has been missing for 29 years. If she's still alive, she would be 59 today. Brittany Ann Ford Brittany was living with her baby Declan in Georgia, along with Declan's father. However, in April 2015, Brittany started behaving as if she was having a mental health incident. She called the police at 3.30 a.m., hysterical and afraid, telling the police that Declan's father was abusing him. The police would respond to the home, and they advised Brittany to take the baby elsewhere for the night. She agreed to go to a hotel, but instead chose to travel to Ohio, where her mother lives. Brittany contacted her mother along the way, panic-stricken. She told her mother that the government is after her and she has to get away. She would eventually travel to where her mother lived. However, after a short time, she accused her stepfather of abusing her younger sister. Brittany's mother and brother were afraid for her, believing that she was suffering from some kind of breakdown. They do not believe that the stepfather hurt the sister, and it's unlikely Declan's father abused him either. Brittany was admitted into the psychiatric ward in Ohio, as there was a concern she was a danger to herself or others. At this time, Declan's father, whose name has never been released, traveled to see her, but she refused to see him. Then, on April 19th, Brittany was discharged. She would leave and go to stay with her brother. A few days later, she took her child, and she told her brother that she was going to the store to get some milk. Instead, she took the child and left. It would be a month before anyone would hear from her again. On May 16, 2015, her brother would receive a call from Brittany requesting that he send her $10,000. Little has been released about this call, but she told him she was in Iowa at the time. The very next day, her car would be found abandoned on the side of the road near Hardin, Montana, between Sheridan, Wyoming and Billings, Montana. This is actually my state and I'm very familiar with all three towns in Wyoming and Montana. Hardin, Montana is a very small town. It's about 45 minutes away from Billings, which is the largest town in Montana. This is just my opinion, but I don't see how anyone could disappear safely in Hardin. It has only a few places to eat, a grocery store and a hardware store. It's absolutely not a place anyone could blend in, and there's no real homeless outreach. It's also a matter of fact that the outskirts of town are not always safe. A lot of indigenous women have gone missing from this area between Hardin and the Crow Reservation. However, 45 minutes away in Billings, there is a homeless shelter and all kinds of resources, but she would have had to make it there. There's no indication if the car was operable when it was abandoned. While people probably think of Montana as mountainous, it's not that way in this area. This is a relatively flat area around Hardin. So if she decided to do something to herself on her own after leaving the vehicle, even if she decided to walk for a while, I believe she would have been found. There are some houses located along this highway, but it's mostly a lot of flat farmland. In my opinion, someone would have had to pick her up, which just leaves the question, what happened to Brittany? If somebody picked Brittany and her son up, why would they leave the car seat? No one has seen or heard from Brittany since. Brittany has been missing for seven years and was 28 when she disappeared. If she's still alive today, she would be 35. Her son, Declan, would be eight years old. Thank you so much for watching and listening. We have new episodes every Monday and Thursday. If you haven't yet, please take a second to hit the subscribe button. Take care of yourselves and each other.